So last night, you tied one on. I mean, you got pretty tore up, right? Uh, you stayed up till like 4.30 in the morning. Uh, you're drinking with your buds. Uh, you know, you got to get up, though, at 5 o'clock and be on the job before 7 o'clock at a construction job. Now you're running a little late. You don't shower. You get dressed. Maybe you grab a beer from the fridge and suck it down real quick just to steady yourself. I mean, you know, very common thing to do. Uh, sometimes uh, you might even have a carpool to go to work. You reek of liquor and beer, uh, but at 5.30 a.m., look, man, you know, you don't really care. You're still buzzed, of course. Your boss and coworker notice that you reek, uh, but they don't say anything. One of your coworkers comes up to you and says, man, you smell like a damn brewery. And you, you all exchange a few choice words. Uh, look, you know, and you don't notice it at the time, but during those choice words, you might even be slurring your speech a little bit. Um, look, you're not worried used to this. You work hard, you play hard, but this job is a roofing job. And on this particular day, still buzzed, you're up on the roof, um, you, you're tied off like you're supposed to be, got your safety harness on and all that, but you miss your footing in the toehold, probably because you're buzzed a little bit. And although you get caught by the safety line, you don't make it all the way to the ground. Uh, you're slammed into the building pretty hard, into the structure pretty hard, and, and you get hurt pretty bad. Uh, you're taken by ambulance to the hospital. They take your blood and you're 0.07 by that time. About two hours later, you're 0.07. Legal limit in Virginia and North Carolina is 0.08 blood alcohol level and you're 0.07. Uh, and of course, though, of course, your injuries are pretty bad. You can't work. So you're fixing, you know, you're caught in the insurance company trying to get your work comp claim going. And you find out that workers' comp insurance company has denied your claim. Why? Because you were under willful intoxication at the time of your injury. What in the heck happened? What is going on? Hi, I'm Joe Miller, workers' compensation attorney in Virginia, North Carolina, and personal injury attorney also. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about the notion of intoxication on the job and its potential effect on your claim. Uh, maybe we should have done this before New Year's, but it's always a good time to party, right? So let's dive right into it. Why does our severely injured roofer uh, get denied his benefits. I mean, he only had a BAC of 0.07, right? Um, there's a couple of answers to that. So the first that is in Virginia, we've discussed in other videos that a claim can be knocked out due to a willful violation of a safety rule, okay? Intoxication is listed in that same law, and it says that if there's a level of alcohol or non-prescribed substance, in excess of the intoxication standard listed in the criminal statute, that creates a presumption that the employee was, in fact, intoxicated and the claim is knocked out. And you don't have a case anymore. But wait, well, let's back up a minute. We just said that he's only at 0.07 and we know the limit's 0.08. So he's not making it to the legal standard, right? So, unfortunately, I did leave out one key element that I didn't discuss yet. When is it? that the intoxication is measured, okay? As far as workers' comp law is concerned, the answer is at the time of the injury, not at the time the blood test was taken two hours later in our example, okay? So we said in our case that the blood wasn't taken until two hours later when it was a 0.07 then, okay? So all the defense has to do in the case, and they know this, is get a toxicologist to come in very simple thing, talk about the rate of, you know, talk about this guy's weight and his height and talk about the, the rate at which he would typically metabolize alcohol uh, and a couple of other things and boom, you wind the clock back two hours and you are well over the 0 0.08 limit. It's a strong presumption, but it's a presumption that if you get this blood test and they can say that you're at 0 0.08 at the time of the accident, that you're, you're, you're going down. You can come in and try to rebut that or you know, try to counter that and say, look, man, I stopped drinking before I went to work and I was fine. I mean, I'm used to this. I drink, you know, I drink frequently and I can handle my alcohol. I was not intoxicated. I was not impaired in any way, but that's where your coworkers are going to come in. They're going to say, look, we, this guy smelled like a brewery. This guy smelled like liquor all over him. And you got the other guy who you had some choice words with, where you slurred your words. That's the end of your case. Some, sometimes people come in and say, look, man, the guy was staggering a little bit. He was off his game. He wasn't right. 
you never should have got up on that roof. The criminal statute that this is referencing in Virginia, where it talks about the standard, the 0.08 standard, makes it illegal to drive and gives legal limits for also for other drugs, such as cocaine, PCP, and crystal meth. Uh, and they, they give the, the standards for those drugs. I'm not going to recite them now, but they're in the statute, the criminal statute that gives you know how many uh, grams per liter or whatever you got to have in your blood before you're over the legal limit for those things. Okay, and they all count for this as well. Okay, any non-prescribed drug or illegal substance is going to count against you on this, whether it's alcohol or one of these other things that I just mentioned. So now that's Virginia. Okay, we talked about that. Let's look at North Carolina for a second. North Carolina's law is slightly more liberal. Okay, if you watch my video on the violation of safety rules. Okay, which you know, I encourage you to watch that. You'll remember that if you got a willful violation of a safety rule in North Carolina, it will not knock out your claim like it will in Virginia. In North Carolina, all it does is reduce your recovery by 10%. Okay, but that is unfortunately not the case with intoxication in North Carolina. Uh, if they can prove that, your case is over. But North Carolina says to be quote unquote intoxicated or under the influence, they've got to show that, and I quote, you have consumed a sufficient quantity of intoxicating beverage or controlled substance to cause you to lose the normal control of your bodily or mental faculties or both to such an extent that there was an appreciable impairment. That's the key word, appreciable impairment, whatever the heck that means, of either or both of those faculties, again, at the time of your injury. That part sounds like it's a little harder for them to reach. It's harder for them to prove. But it also has that sticky leg. It's the same thing like in Virginia. If your blood test came back and then wind the clock back at the, to the time of the injury, okay, they can prove that you're over the legal limit. They do a blood test on you and you're over the legal limit at the time of the accident. That creates a presumption that you were impaired at the time of the accident and boom, your case is out. In many ways, it is like Virginia. It sounds more liberal, but it's really not. You might be asking me, look, Miller, uh, let me get this straight. Are you telling me that I'm on the job, uh, something just falls on me out of nowhere, okay? And they, somebody else messes up and I get hurt. They find out I'm drunk and I got no case. Is that what you're telling me? And the answer is no, I'm not telling you that. Why? Because I left out another little piece that we're going to talk about now. And I didn't say that yet because both Virginia and North Carolina require that this intoxication, this impairment must have caused your injury, okay? Uh, injury has to be caused by the intoxication and the roofer example that I gave at the beginning, yeah, everything re requires you to be balanced, okay, and stay on the roof. You know, it's very easy to argue, look, you were impaired, you were buzzed, you fell off the roof. Let's say you had to be drunk on the job, which still is not a good idea because your employer may have rules against that and you gotta be careful about it. You don't wanna get fired, uh, but you're drunk on the job you say riding, let's say you're riding in a passenger in a work truck and you get, you get in a car accident. You're being intoxicated, if they, whether they find it in your blood or not, has zero to do with you getting hurt in that car crash. Give another example, you're on the job site doing what you're supposed to do. Someone, as we said before, drops a big old piece of equipment on you um, without warning and you're hurt really bad as a result. Uh, unless they can show you were warned about this piece of equipment coming down and you failed to move out of the way, you failed to respond appropriately, um, or that you were not where you were supposed to be because you were buzzed and you weren't paying attention, um, you know, because of your intoxication, you're being drunk or being intoxicated has zero to do with you getting hurt on the job. So it has to be a cause of the injury. Um, what you usually see in these intoxication cases where it becomes an issue is where you're engaged in your job at the time of the injury, and that job depends on your balance, your coordination, your attention, such as falling off a roof, right? Uh, operating machinery or driving. If they can prove you were over the legal limit at the time of the accident, not, you know, that's the key moment. Even if your blood is, is lower under the limit later, it doesn't matter. If they can prove it was over the limit at the time of the accident, they get a big presumption that you were intoxicated, your case is finished. So the bottom line, my considered advice to everybody out there who's thinking of getting wasted on a work night, look, man, if at all possible, okay, you're still buzzed when you get up, even if you don't feel buzzed, but you know you stopped drinking or using pretty close to the time that you got to be at work, if you can get away with it and not get fired, 
call in sick, my man. Call in sick, especially if your job you know, requires you to work in heights, operate machinery, things like that. Um, it's not worth it to get hurt. Uh, as we just discussed, there's a good chance you're not going to recover a penny, okay, because they're going to be able to prove intoxication because they almost always do. As far as I know, I've ever, ever seen, they always do blood tests at the hospital, okay? And if they don't do blood tests at the hospital, you, you can be darn sure your employer, especially the larger employers, are always going to require a blood test after any work injury, okay? Um, and no matter how badly you're hurt. And so they're going to find out that, you know, your blood alcohol level or your level of illegal substance, whatever it is that you got in your body that you're not supposed to have. And so it's better, call in sick. You get hurt bad and you're intoxicated, this is not a place you want to be could be hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical bills hanging over your head, not to mention the loss of income um, and not be able to work due to your injuries for who knows how long. So I hope this helps you understand the intoxication defense uh, in a workers' comp case. You really want to avoid it. You really want to not be caught with your pants down, um, buzzed at work, and get hurt. Um, so if, if you're too buzzed to go to work, stay home, okay? That's my best advice to you. If you're alone and were hurt, in a work accident or a car accident in Virginia, North Carolina, please don't hesitate to give me a call. Meanwhile, this is Joe Miller, workers' comp attorney, personal injury attorney. Have a blessed day. Joe Miller out.